Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third episode of our Switch to Clarity webinar series. Um, today, I would like to um, invite you guys to tell us where you're from. In the lower right hand corner, you see a chat box. And in this chat box, um, just type in where you're joining us from. Um, that would be really, really nice. Just to see also if the chat box is working um, for you guys. Um, once I see the first person writing something there, I will continue. Just write where you're from in the say hello chat box on the lower right hand corner. Oh, we have a shy crowd today. <laughs> So come on, guys. Where are you joining from? Usually we have uh, quite a big list of um, people writing something. So I just want to make sure that the chat is really working and the recording is working. Um, let me check. Hmm. Okay, seems that we have an issue on our side. We have an Let's issue on our the... side. Why don't we see anything in the chat box? That's a bit bad. All right, so for some reason, I can't see anything in the chat box. Um, it will be fine. Um, we, I will just continue <laughs> in this case. Um, sorry for that. Anyway, um, if you have any questions, um, please don't put them in the chat box. Put them in the ask a question tab you see on a lower hand right on the bottom. Um, and you can also upvote the questions of others if you are interested in that question being answered. And uh, at the very end of the webinar, we will dedicate around 15 minutes to our Q&A session. And um, we probably won't have time to answer every single question of the audience, but we will then um, preferably ask those who, uh, the ones that are upvoted the most. Um, right, so we also have prepared two polls uh, later on, uh, which I will activate once we are at that point. Um, the webinar is recorded and uh, the recording will be available at the same link that you are joining from right now. Um, so don't worry, the recording as well as the slides will be ready. Um, right, so uh, then let me share our slides for today's session. One second. Share. Okay. Um, have you joined the webinar as well? Um, it could yeah. be great to see what happens uh, yeah. on your screen. One second. So, um, do you all see the starter slide? Uh, pre launch Joseph community? I dearly hope so. Uh, let me just check um, one second. And the other, if you could go to the tab. Step. Okay. Go um, go so today um, we have uh, myself as the presenter again. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm the founder and the CEO of Switch. Um, right next to me sits Andre. He's our CTO. Hi guys. And um, we also have um, Shalim joining us. Um, he's the head of technical delivery of Joseph. Um, and we also have invited Lukas uh, Lombrisa from Designwerk. Uh, he is a system engineer from Designwerk, and he will tell us a little bit about the, uh, his experience um, with Joseph. Uh, he is one of the early contributors to our open source uh, framework. And uh, also, also our lovely Samantha, she will help us as a moderator today um, to sort out the questions um, that you guys are asking us. All right, um, a short, um, short slide on what we do. So we at Switch, um, we build the technology that enables EV charging for um, 
that enables a seamlessly running EV charging. Um, so we basically provide um, two pieces of sof software. One is Joseph. That's what we are talking about today for EV charging manufacturers. Um, that's an operating system for AC and DC charging. And the other product is Sara, that is our cloud-based charging station management system developed side by side um, from the same team that also develops Joseph. And that's for it's targeting all the charge point network operators out there. So this is our agenda for today. Um, first, I want to talk to you a little bit about why we make things open source. Um, then I will tell you more about what Joseph community does entail and how it does compare to Joseph professional. And then um, we will tell you a bit about uh, when it will be published and what are the next steps. Um, also how you can get started um, and can contribute to Joseph community. And uh, in the end, uh, we will give the microphone to Lucas so he can tell us a bit more about his experience, why they decided to join uh, Joseph community as an early contributor and also how the experience has been so far. And in the end, um, as I said, around 15 minutes will be dedicated to a Q&A session. Right, so why do we make um, Joseph open source? Um, well, first of all, sharing knowledge is part of our DNA. And um, we do believe that sharing knowledge does and make the tide rise for all quicker and um, we do get there quicker um, by collaborating on a solid foundation um, that everyone can use to build their value added solutions on top and i think this will um, always create a more durable outcome um, we do hope that this will foster um, interoperability um, i have been in this space for many years now um, i've been to the first ever testing symposium in 2014 um, and I think there have been like 13 um, festivals ever since. And I see newcomers to the um, industry that always stumble upon the same mistakes. And this kind of doesn't make too much sense. We have a problem. It seems to be frozen, the presentation. You need to go to full screen. You full screen need off. to go to full screen. Sorry. Um, something is off here. No, maybe. I think I know what's, what's the problem. I need to share my full screen instead of just a window. Sorry for that. And now we should be back. Sometimes I still need to get used to how crowd trust really works. Um, you should see my slides now. Yeah, I think now it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for that little glitch. Sorry, guys, we've been having some technicalities today. Let's try to make it more smooth now. My, my I'm just looking to the right because um, we see how it's working. Just some delay there, but I think it's fine now. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you all see um, the why we make <laughs> Joseph open source now. Yeah. Now it's working. Good. Um. So the idea is to foster interoperability and to not make everyone trying to reinvent the wheel. Um. <clears throat> and instead um, provide everyone with the same solid foundation um, that will then alleviate most interoperability issues. And I've been, I mean, I've been involved personally with the ISO 15118 standard um, since its inception in 2010. And um, I see a very big potential for this standard. It is the future-proof technology to enable seamless charging, a plug and charge vehicle to grid. <clears throat> and I really, really want this technology to be adopted sooner than later. Um, so with our Joseph community project, we hope that this kind of lowers the, the, the entry, the, the barrier to entry. And um, um, yeah, just helps to um, adopt this technology in every EV charging station and wall box. And a smart uh, person called Napoleon Hill once said, 
it is literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. Um, if you haven't read his book, um, Think and Grow Rich, where rich ne doesn't necessarily mean monetarily rich, I highly recommend. It's a really great book to read. Right. So what does Joseph community consist of and how does it compare to Joseph professional version, our commercial offer to the industry? Well, Joseph community does come with a full implementation of ISO 15118-2, including plug and charge, which is a seamless um, mechanism to start charging. So no RFID cards needed, no um, apps you have to install on your phone in order to get um, authorized for the charging se uh, session. Just plug in your cable and start charging. That's the idea behind plug and charge. And that is basically right now the driving force behind um, adopting ISO 15118 in the market with Seed, with Porsche Taycan, with the Ford Mach E, with the Mercedes EQS, uh, Audi e-tron, so on. More and more vehicles are coming to market that adopt ISO 15118. Um, Dash two is covering the the majority of the communication um, that the EV and the charging station exchange, all the messages that are need to be ex exchanged. The ISO 15118 three. Um, governs the lower level communication so that the charging station and the vehicle can set up a communication link in the first place based on which the dash two is then used to, ex to you know, exchange all the messages. And there's a mechanism called Slack, um, which makes sure that we can use power line communication to um, create a definitive link between the car that is connected to the charging physically um, and the charging station. But it doesn't end there. We are also already implementing ISO 15118-20, which um, has been released last week, I think Thursday, um, as an international standard. Being part of the standardization body, we have um, had early access to the standard. We have been writing parts of the standard ourselves. So naturally, we have enough time to already start implementing it early on. And um, Joseph community already has features of Dash 20 implemented. Um, also, DINSPEC 71 to 1, which is a DC charging specification that was created um, in the early days as an interim solution until ISO 15118 itself was published. So ISO 15118 was first published in 2014, but the market for DC charging didn't want to wait as long. Um, so they published a, they, take, they basically took the DC charging part of it and um, published a German specification. That's what DINSPEC uh, stands for and um, just took the DC charging part, no smart charging, no plug and charge, no security. Um, and that was supposed to be just an interim solution and taken off um, once 15118 was published, but nothing is as durable as an interim solution and will be in the market for several years to come. So that's why we decided we need to support the standard as well um, for interoperability sake. Also, uh, the XI codec, um, XI, um, Shalin will tell you a little bit more about that, what it really means. Um, in short, it's basically a, a codec that enables the charging station and the vehicle to efficiently exchange messages between each other. There is a very popular open source um, codec available that is called Exefficient, uh, available in several languages, uh, in Java is, is one of them. But Exefficient doesn't have any support for the ISO 15118-20 yet. But we used Exefficient, extended it um, to provide ISO 15118 support as well. All of Joseph community is implemented in Python at the moment. Only the XI codec is implemented in Java based on the existing open source solution. And we provide that as a uh, char uh, file. Now, how does it compare to Joseph Professional? Well, Joseph Professional is based on Joseph Community, so it entails everything in Joseph Community, except for the XA codec in Java, plus um, any company that uh, opts to go with Switch and to use Joseph on their charging stations, they get unlimited support from the Switch team because we want to make sure that the software is running perfectly on your charger, no matter how much time it takes. So. Um, we will be standing by your side uh, until everything is ready. Plus, um, our own OCPP 2.0.1 implementation 
So OCPP is short for Open Charge Point Protocol, which is a de facto standard used in the industry for the communication between a charging station and the cloud-based charging station management system. And 2.0.1 has a lot of beneficial features. We covered them in our first webinar episode, end of February. So if you head to our website, the news and insights section, we linked our webinar and uh, all the Q and A's and the answers to those questions. Uh, so I will spare you the deep dive into OCPP for now. Um, also, we use MQTT, which is a, a lightweight um, IoT protocol that has been invented by I IBM um, many years ago and is adopted as an industry-wide solution. Um, and we use it to connect the different um, software parts in Joseph. Joseph is basically a microservice architecture where we have ISO 15.11.8, OCPP, the hardware manufacturer specific um, code, let's say the drivers to um, control the hardware in the charging station. Plus, if you want so, third party applications that you can install on the charger as well. This is all enabled via MQTT and a message broker. And we have a well-defined application programming interface, API. It defines how all the uh, bits and pieces in Joseph Professional and the hardware code exchange properly the information. So that's part of our professional offer as well. Um, plus, um, we, it comes with an, what we call an ISO 15118 message analyzer. What this means is you as a charge point operator, um, you usually do not have any information about the communication between the vehicle and the charging station. When it, specifically when it comes to ISO 15118, which is just now being introduced to the market, but if something goes wrong, let's say the car cannot pass a message from the charger properly or vice versa, or a certificate has expired and therefore plug and charge doesn't work. All these hundreds of possible um, corner cases that can go wrong, we can visualize this properly in our own um, charging station management system to, ease, to make the debugging process easier. So you have more information, more insights into what went wrong if something goes wrong. That's very use, helpful for the charge point operator, but also for the EV driver, because then you can send uh, proper messages to the charger's display to let the EV driver know what went wrong. Last but not least, I mentioned the XI codec. We don't use the Java version. We have fully implemented our own XI codec from scratch, written in Rust. Um, Rust is a very efficient um, low level programming language, which means we have uh, less um, resource um, Required. requirements, thank you, for um, the um, charging board, the, the hardware that sits inside the charging station on which Joseph will run, because the encoding and decoding of messages is a quite resource hungry uh, or a quite resource hungry process. So it was important for us to use a, an efficient and modern programming language like Rust to do so. So, um, with that, I would like to hand over to Shalin. He will um, give you a very short intro to execution versus, um, which is a Java-based exit codec versus our own um, exit codec, which we call Rexy. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. So like Mark mentioned earlier, XI is a way to binarize XML messages, which is required. It's an integral part of 1511.8 protocol family. Now, what Xefficient is perhaps the most popular open XI, uh, XI engine out there. It's fully featured and what we are open sourcing today is uh, has got support for 15.11.8 uh, AC, DC, and also 15.11.8-20, not just AC and AC BPT, but also DC and DC BPT messages. And on top of that, DIN spec as well. So what we have tried to do is we have removed the bits which are not required in Xefficient because like I said, Xefficient is a fully featured open source engine. And for 15.11.8, we are interested in a very specific uh, flavor of XI. So we have removed all that and the final jar comes to 13 MB. And in order to run this, there is also this additional requirement of getting the getting JVM up and running on your controller. Now there is, uh, yeah. So the one minor drawback with Xefficient is the lack of useful error messages. 
what you see here on screen is an XI sample XI stream. So this is actually XI stream for support app protocol response message. This is the smallest XI stream I could find. Now you can see the error message here is not very useful when it comes to debugging. Now this is where Rust XI makes a big difference. Uh, Rust XI was fully, like Mark mentioned, is written from scratch in Rust. It's high performant, and as a result, it's got lower hardware software requirements. So this means you can run on lower spec hardware. So this lowers down, this drives down cost, and this is sort of like a numbers game. So every saving you can make would significant would be quite significant as the numbers as the number of charging stations go up. And on top of that, for debugging purposes, you get really useful error messages. And it, because, especially because XI is fine tuned for 15.11.8 protocol family. So you can see the kind of, uh, yeah, so the error, the XI stream here is the same. However, the error message is way more informative. It gives us way more information regarding what has gone wrong. Um, yeah. So also, there is. One other point to make here. So like Mark mentioned, there is this uh, charging station, our own charging station management system called Sarah. And Sarah binds very well with Joseph. What that means is remotely you can access everything that happens on your charging station. This helps go above and beyond what OCPP 201 and 15.11.8 can offer. You can actually visualize every single packet that is ever exchanged between the charging station and the EV. So the relevance of this comes when things go wrong, when when everything works, nobody cares, but when things go wrong, you want every bit of information you need. And that is where, yeah, and th this helps us do that. Um, do, do you wanna move to the next slide? Yeah, just, just to give uh, an exa a comparison for performance between X-efficient and the Rust version. So. Uh, the messages listed here are taken from a Dash 20 AC session on the SACC side. Uh, the messages listed on the left uh, are in the same sequence as they appear during the charging session. Uh, in the second column, we have the size of the uh, XML in bytes. And third column is the corresponding XI stream in bytes. So if you look at the very first message supported app protocol response, you can see the sort of compression it achieves 317 becomes four. And fourth column is the X efficient performance in milliseconds. And just to point out in the last column, it's Rust size performance in microseconds. So you can see the kind of performance boost we have achieved with Rust XI. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, I would like to hand it back to Mark. Thank you, thank you, Charlene. Um, yes. Yeah, so this this is a, a really great achievement, and <laughs> XI itself um, is is really a beast. The specification itself is is a good literature to to read if you have problems sleeping. Um, <laughs> it, it's really hard <laughs> to read, and uh, Charlene was um, the one who had to go through it and implemented uh, Rexa within six months. So thanks a lot <laughs> for that, uh, for putting all uh, all the hard work into it. Right. So when will Joseph Community be available? We will launch it on May twenty fourth, and um, it will be then available. Uh, let me just actually change briefly. You should see this uh, page. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, so we have a new blog post that we launched today. If you go to our website and to, to the news and uh, events section, um, there you will see a new blog article called Introducing Joseph Community where we uh, explain a little bit more about what Joseph uh, is all about, what Joseph community is about and Joseph professional. You will uh, hear most of it in this webinar. But if you scroll down, you also see a countdown. And once this countdown is up, we will reveal on this page the GitHub repository um, and we'll link it to that GitHub repository. Right, next steps. 
Um, so all you see here on the left side um, has already been implemented. Joseph Community um, comes with all these things, including Dash 20. However, Dash 20 is quite a beast in itself. It has, I think, around 550 pages. The Dash 2 standard was challenging enough with 365 pages. So we have like 190 pages more, roughly. And uh, the reason why it is so big is because it covers all kinds of different energy transfer modes. Um, with energy transfer mode, I mean AC charging, DC charging, wireless charging, pentagraph charging for buses. Um, wireless as well. Wireless. Yeah. Um, and just lots of wills and uh, um, how do you say it? But lots of features that come with it. Um, you don't have to implement everything. Um, you just need to focus on, on what your product needs. So if you are just an AC charging manufacturer, you focus on the AC charging part. Likewise, when it comes to DC chargers or pentograph charging. So um, right now, um, what is still missing in this list is ISO 15118-8, which is for wireless communication. So it establishes the data link between the vehicle and the charging station via wireless communication, which is based on the Wi-Fi standard IEEE 802.11n. Um, this will come in the near future, but we haven't had the time yet to attend to that specification. Then um, when it comes to ACD, uh, to ISO 1508-20, we start with AC and DC support, also for bidirectional power transfer, BPT. Um, what we haven't done so far is Pantograph charging um, via ACD, where ACD stands for Automated Connection Device, uh, and also wireless charging. These will follow and probably um, kind of like determined by our client project. So as soon as we have uh, clients coming to us that need uh, specifically pantograph charging developed, we will prioritize that over, for example, wireless charging. And you can contribute as well to Joseph community. I mean, that is the purpose of this open source project. And, um, you know, the more you contribute, um, the quicker we might develop uh, one or the other feature. With that, I would like to hand over to Andre. Thank you, Mark. And hi, everyone again. Thanks so much for joining. Um, so I would like to um, give you a bit of uh, how the structure of the project is um, and the Joseph community uh, looks like in different repos. Um, and, and then I will um, show around as well how to start and configure the EV and charger side. Um, so all the different settings that we can add um, in order to modify the, um, the environment and um, as such the, the behavior of the code itself. Um, and then I'll pass it again to, to Shalin and Shalin will perform a live demo um, where you can actually see um, things going and some low level message. Um, later on, I will also um, be more specific about how to contribute, but it's a general kind of rules that uh, the community follows using GitHub. And and finally, um, we will share the GitHub uh, repo URL, which Mark already yeah, actually did, did already yeah. uh, earlier, <laughs> but we can mention it again. Um, so, Mark, can you help right. me here to go then for the GitHub repo? Yes. Thank so, you. Which so this, this one, one? Okay. starts. And so, as you see here, this is the currently um, the repo uh, for the fifth eleven eight itself. Um, it follows a general structure, normal structure for um, repositories, and specifically this one is, as we said, is for Python. Um, so what I want to highlight here is just a few of the files that may be more interesting and then go through a little bit through the readme. Um, so as you see, we have uh, by project Tomolo define all the dependencies of the project um, that are locked into their own versions. Um, we have uh, dependencies for uh, development and also for production. We also have um, the readme itself, which I will go um, be more specific about very soon. Um, we have a change log containing all the differences uh, between the versions that we currently have released. Um, so which um, keep, uh, keep things a bit more concise and helps to figure out what has changed over different versions. Um, we also have uh, Docker support, so that's why you, have, you will see these uh, Docker files here, 
um, but I will not uh, be very specific about it uh, during this webinar due to the short of time. So let me quickly go through the README. Um, we try to make it very simple to understand how to, to set it up and to fight up everything. Um, so you tell you um, what you're going to need for, for run it. Um, and uh, we include that we need Python uh, above 3.7 and poetry um, for it. And uh, then for the installation process, we have a make file, which I didn't mention before, but we do have a make file that helps a little bit uh, setting, up, setting, up, setting up, sorry, setting up everything. Um, includes also a helper. Um, so it's, it includes all the receipts here that you may want to use, including um, to install the project and um, to, to run the project and also to perform some, for example, some code quality um, kind of um, tasks. Yes, because we also want to make everything um, according with the high level of standards in the industry. Um, that means that we include unit tests. That's why the test folder is included here. Um, we include um, linting as well. Um, and this is all running into our CI CD using GitHub Actions. So um, later on, when you talk about contribution, um, I can be a little bit more specific about it as well. Um, the code uh, then lives in the ISO 11 8 directory. Um, and it's pretty much clear about how do we separate things. We have um, the EVCC side, the station side, and then shared code um, that um, both of these applications use. Um, I don't want to go further on on this one, but um, I just want to more be more specific about the, the, the README. Uh, so after everything is set up and you, you install the, the project, using, for example, the makefile receipts, um, you can run either the SCCC site or the vehicle site. Um, just, just a short um, yes, uh, interjection. Ahead. For those who don't know the term, SECC, um, it's very commonly used in, in the ISO 15.11 realm. SECC stands for Supply Equipment Communication Controller. That's basically the communication controller sitting inside the charging station. And EVCC is the equivalent on the EV side uh, EV communication controller. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for that. Um, so what then I would like to focus on, besides here's some, um, some warnings that you provide, that's not much important for that. Now, it's the environmental settings, which um, one can use to modify the behavior of the code. So you have a few of them. Um, one that is here highlighted as uh, the first is the network interface one which is probably one of the most important ones, if not the most important one, as uh, if this is not correctly set up, then it won't work as the interface must have an IPv6 uh, local address um, um, already configured. Um, so once your interface contains uh, that kind of link, um, then it's possible to start the application. We also have a few other settings um, that configure either the SECC side or the station side or the vehicle side, um, specifically about TLS communication. Um, so if the SEC enforced TLS uh, false or true, we uh, force the communication to go through TLS. So if the vehicle does not support it, then things will not go on and the, the application will stop there. Um, and then the vehicle side, we have two um, main configurations, which is use TLS, which is a more soft way of using TLS. So we, if the vehicle promotes TLS, but doesn't necessarily um, uh, needs to go through the TLS, the communication between vehicle and station. So if the station does not support TLS, vehicle will still accept and go on with the communication. And another one is to really to enforce it. So when, when it's true, it means that the vehicle will not go on with any communication that is not TLS. One, well, also one addition to that, um, in ISO 1511-8-2, TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security, so encrypting the communication between the car and the charging station, is optional if you want to do what is called external identification means, and that means uh, RFID card authentication or credit card authentication, anything that is not plug and charge. When you do plug and charge, then, then, you, need TLS. then you need TLS definitely in dash two, 
in ISO 15.11-20, um, TLS is absolutely mandatory in any any use case. Sure. And the reason why we use uh, EBCC use TLS kind of like to, to, to enable it to opt out of it, so to say, is first of all for testing purposes. Um, if, if the counterpart hasn't implemented TLS, then you can at least skip that and test the rest of the communication. But um, please always try to use TLS. Um, otherwise, um, it's an entry door for hackers. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so just to go on quickly, we have a few other settings. One is for the PKI path. Um, so this is the path where the certificates are stored. Uh, for your convenience and to allow testing, we do include um, a script, and we mention it in the readme, to generate the, um, the PKI. So it's also, uh, it also contains a helper. So once you run these commands, it will uh, fire up a helper, and you can see what you need to do to generate. Uh, by default, we'll generate the PKI path under this uh, folder as we have made slash share slash pqi and so by default the system will also try to find the certificates under this path but um, if you need another kind of path you and you have your own certificate stored anywhere else then you can just use this environmental setting and point it to that path in specific um, so then we have more um, configurations related to logging one is the general log level which by default is info and can be changed to, to debug. Um, and we also have message log JSON. So this means that when true, it will log any JSON uh, message that we have ongoing between um, vehicle and station. And one that can sometimes be also interesting for debugging is the exit itself. So we provide uh, more insight of what is the byte stream that is um, exchange between vehicle and station. So these um, kind of configurations, we will see um, that uh, Shadlin will use them um, during his presentation, during his live demo. And so I will go on and just give you an overlook now on the Slack one. Um, it will be quick on the Slack one because it follows more or less the same structure um, as more or less the same files and um, also the same quality that is enforced in the ISO 5118 repo also will be enforced in Slack. So um, same kind of rhythm as well, uh, where we have um, the same dependencies or um, background dependencies of Pottery and Python, um, and we fire up, that's exactly kind of exactly the same way. So we drew the make file um, with make builds and also install it using make install local and then we just have a different receipts to to run it but it's kind of the same structure itself um so slack as i said contains also tests it also includes all the unit tests um, that we require to be passed in order for the contribution uh, for the contributions for for the repo to go on um and yeah you you guys can can check it out later on once we release it and um obviously contribute and tell us what you think. So now I would like to pass it to Shalin. Shalin will give you more insights on the 5118 and how to spin it up and see it, um, the message ongoing with vehicle and station. Okay, yep. thank you, Andre. So I'm trying to share my screen here. I'm having one sec. It, it, it keeps bailing out on me. Um, so Shalin will show you guys um, how to run the, the station site um, and the vehicle site using a project. Um, it will show you um, how to, to configure it to run the dash two or the dash 20 or even the Dean spec. Um, we also play around a bit with the environmental settings uh, to show different log levels and what kind of information we provide. And um, yeah, to the very end, you can see uh, how everything works. Yeah. If uh, you're able to share. <laughs> yeah, once I can share. Um, it, it, it keeps going up. It keeps going up? Yeah, yeah. So the 
buttons which let me share so I can see the mic button video. Uh, oh, boy. One second. Oh, sorry. What do you say? Sorry, what did I do now? This video. Did you send him some permissions? Uh, no, I, I can't seem to press on that button. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. Oh, finally. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what is this? Uh, I'm close it. So okay, let me share. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to share the entire screen. Um, let, let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, uh, can yeah. you see? Okay. Now, now we see something, yeah? Yes, yeah. we do. Okay, now we can see one. One second. Okay. Okay, yeah, so uh, so this is the entire repository. So you can see uh, within 15.11.8, so you can see the EBCC, SCCC, and shared folders. The bits that are of interest to us today are the environment file. So these are the environment variables which Andre mentioned, um, you know, which are there in the a description of which are available in the readme file. So the first thing to modify would be the network interface because I'm running this on a Mac. Modify this to EN0. There are uh, also, before that, there are two versions of environment files available, the local and the Docker one. Today we'll be looking at the local one. So the way we do it is make a copy of it, call it .env uh, because I'm running it on a Mac, change it to EN0. Uh, the bits that are of interest uh, for now, uh, log level, so it's set to in info and there is also the PKI path, which, are, which is the path to the uh, certificates that you need if you're running uh, dash 20 or dash two. Yeah. Uh, there are utilities within the shared PKI folder, uh, which would help you generate certificates for your testing purposes. So create certs.sh. The certificates required for dash two and dash 20 are slightly different. So depending on which one you're running, so you just run that, uh, creates its and dash 20. And that would generate certificates. So you can see the folder name, you copy the path and paste it in the end file under PKI path. Um, and once you clone the repository and once you set up the PKI path and the uh, network interface, you can install uh, the project as a Python package by running uh, make install local. So all, all this you can see straight away within the um, within the make file itself. So once that is run, you can run the SCCC side of things. Yep, now SCCC is up and running and waiting. And on the other side, we can run the um, EVCC simulator. Yeah, so it ran all the way till session stop. Now, because log level is set to info, there isn't much information. All you see here is the state transitions that happened during the charging process. Uh, now, if I change this to debug and then rerun the session, so we'll see. Fire on that again. Now we get way more information and also a structure of the payloads that were passed. Um, so right now, if you can see, this is a dash two session, but going by the structure of the message. And within the EVCC, EVCC settings file, you can there is this list which holds the uh, protocols that are supported, and they're listed in the order of preference for EVCC. So in uh, right now, top of the list is dash two. And if I comment that out, now 
the top of the list is now dash 20 and dash 20 AC to be more specific. So once I do that, I we can install the package once again. Let me stop this. Yeah, so that has run, run a CCC. And same as before, run EVCC simulator on the other side. And right now, going by the structure of the message, you can see what it ran was a dash 20 AC charging session. Um, yeah. And on top of this, there are also a bit more, a lot more logging options available. Like uh, Andre said, you can also log a JSON structure, which you have seen already. Now, one thing that is set to false by default is the XI stream. So you can set that. And yeah, so basically these are all the things that you can play around once you get access to the repository. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Shalin. Um, that was a great demo. So let me get back to uh, screen sharing our slides, um, which is nice for me. Switch. Right. Um, we focus here. Oh, shit. <laughs> no, it should be hopefully good. Um, what we Actually, what I wanted to do now is uh, start a poll. Let's stop this video. Um, so we have two polls prepared for you. The first one I will should pop up now on your screen. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, could our Python-based Joseph community be a good technological fit for your product? Yes or no? Um, just hope it's showing up it's showing up now it's showing up perfect so i give i give you guys like two minutes or one minute um to vote yes or no so do you think python uh, our joseph community or joseph professional which is also for now python based but we will convert it over time into rust to also make sure it runs on more resource constrained uh, controllers By the way, um, we are going to be part of a festival this week in uh, Vector Facilities uh, here in Stuttgart. Um, and we are actually going to to use this application, to use our Joseph uh, community and Joseph professional, actually, um, to, to do all the tests and validate what we have done so far. Um, so it will be a great opportunity for us to have uh, exchange of information with the rest of the community and to test around. And we'll be focused on a Dash 20, actually. So it's a completely new standard. The first time, I think, that is happening uh, right now globally. Yeah. So it will be a great, great opportunity for us to see um, how the rest of the, of the community is going with a Dash 20. Exactly. The, the char in festivals um, that take place three times a year, North America, Europe, and Asia. Sorry for the noise. It's a lot of rain outside all of a sudden. Um, they will pick up ISO 1511A-20 soon, I think towards the end of the year, maybe in the North America festival. But right now, um, I don't know when. So tomorrow, no, on Thursday, Thursday is the first opportunity we have so far. So um, thank you for uh, giving your response. We have 13 votes for yes. You think Python, uh, our Joseph uh, community could be a good fit. Um, six or seven people said no. Um, we require a Linux uh, underneath. Um, so for all those who use a microcontroller based architecture, um, Joseph will unfortunately at, at this point uh, not be suitable. Right, uh, another poll, the final one, I uh, promise. We would like to know from you, which operating system would you consider for your products? Um, is it Joseph Professional, which comes with uh, OCPP201, um, the MQTT um, broker and all the rest? Do you have your own proprietary solution and that you prefer to use for um, specific reasons? Maybe uh, another solution provider, or is it maybe a mix of your own 
um, proprietary software that you build on top of Joseph Professional, um, which is actually what we anticipated Joseph to be used for in the most cases, I assume. Because there's the hardware, there, there are drivers for all the hardware in your charging station. Maybe you have your own um, IP that you want to put in your on your charger. Maybe it relates to smart charging. But the basic foundation um, we anticipate should always be Joseph, ideally, because that's a solid foundation that everyone can start building their solutions um, on top of. Let's give it a minute. Okay, so there are basically two answers we see here, either uh, my own proprietary solution or a mix of our software with Joseph um, Community or Joseph Professional. So with a tendency towards a mix of the solution with Joseph. Um, so that is uh, quite nice to hear. Right. Um, we are running a little bit over time. Uh, I hope you have a little bit more time than 60 minutes that we anticipated at first, because um, I want to give uh, the microphone to uh, Lucas um, so he can share a little bit um, how his experience has been so far with um, Switch. Yes, hello everybody. Um, my name is Lucas. I work for the company Design Work. Um, and I you am, probably want my slides, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Could you show, please? The... Uh, let me just. Uh, where is my screen? Share screen. Um, screen. One second, it's coming. Do you see? Um, yeah, but it's just small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, me. Is it bigger now? Uh, yes, now I can see it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, Yes, I am the first uh, contributor of the pro project Joseph, and um, yeah, I work for the company Designwork. Um, Designwork was uh, founded in the year 2007, and it has always been the goal to, to advance the electromobility. So, and meanwhile, we have three products. We have um, electric commercial vehicles we have um, ev high voltage batteries and we have mobile fast charges um, next slide no no not that sorry <laughs> uh, here you can see the the mobile fast charge 44 kilowatt um, yes and over dc output voltage range is from 250 volts to 1000 volts yeah that's that are, there are just some facts about overcharges yeah could you go to the next slide please um mark can you mute your mic maybe mm -hmm. sorry one second mm. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, yes, here you can see um, how we have implemented the, the Joseph open source project in, in our charger. Um, it's just a very rough uh, block diagram, but I would like to explain how our chargers work. On the lower side, you can see the, the hardware components left on the lower left side there is um the, the mains plug it is a normally a, a normal red industrial plug and then it goes 
it goes to the power electronics. Power electronics um, converts the power to DC. And then on the lower right side, you see the, the EV plug, the CCS EV plug. And beside the, the power lines, we have also the communication line, the CP, the, the PLC. Um, close to the, to the DC outlet, there we have located a PLC board called CCS hardware interface. On this, on this um, PCB board, you can see the CP line is split. Um, on the left side, there is um, the generator for the for the CP signal. That means um, it makes the the states A, B, C, and it makes the the pulse width modulation. And on the right side, there is the PLC chip, and the PLC chip receives the high level messages from the ISO from the ISO standard from the ISO protocol, um, and it modulate it modulates the messages on the CP line, and so the the um, the charger communicates with the with the EV. On the upper side, you can see over over Linux controller um, as Mark said before you have to take a Linux controller um, and these two blocks represent um, two processes. On the top left you can see the charge controller. It is our, yeah, our main our main process. It, it, um, it communicates with the power electronics. It gives them demands how much current should it bring how much how big should the voltage be and so on but it also communicates with our ccs handler um, this is made over um, in our case it's made over uh, zero message queue and this interface phase provides data for um, from the ccs handler like um, how much, like uh, the demands from the from the EV, how much current it it demands, but in other direction, the charge controller informs the CCS, CCS handler about the current state of the power electronics. Um, yeah, and now on the top right side. Now it's getting more interesting. You can see our process CCS handler, and there the most, um, the most, the most interesting or the most um, the biggest part is Joseph community and the open source project. Um, in this project, we have all the all the security, all the all the DC states, all the AC states, and so on. Um, yes, as there is the yeah yeah exactly. Thank you. Um, there is the ISO the ISO standards dash two and dash twenty are there, but also the exe codec as said um, from Mark before. And overlaid over this Joseph um, project, we have our own um, CCS state machine. This state machine controls the the CPC signal. It tells it says um, now you have to go to 12 volt. Now you have to make um, PVM uh, pulse width modulation, modulation, and so on. But it also controls the the slug. This is our Owen um, slug Im implementation. Um, 
Yes. That's it just, just for you that you have a bit of insight how we have used the, the Joseph protocol, the Joseph project. Yeah, could you? Thank you. So um, why did we decide to work with Switch? Um, for different reasons, we were looking for a new uh, ESM implementation for our mobile charges. The, the main reason was because we were no longer um, satisfied with our um, current implementation because of the, of the performance and yeah, the implementation was not so great. So we were looking for a new implementation and we came in contact with Mark and Switch and the project uh, Joseph. For us, it seemed that Joseph is the right fist because it saves costs, it reduces um, the complexity and accelerated over time to market. Yeah, um, I mean, if we would have it completely done by ourselves, yeah, we would have it would have taken at least at least two years. So, and now it's two or three months, and we have a run in the system. Yeah, and of course the the team switch it is um, known for ex expertise and focus on um, compatibility with with the with all EVs that are available on the market. Yes, and some words about the, the collaboration with Switch. Um, I can say the Joseph project, it is really, really well documented. Um, you have everywhere, you have um, references to the, to the ISO standard, so you, you know where to look in the standard and why it is coded like this. Yeah, that is re really great. Um, yeah, of course, we were able to benefit from Switch's deep know-how regarding the plug-in charge and handling of certificates because we didn't have this know-how in our company. But um, yeah, in other direction, we design work and we were able to bring over experience in DC charging and that is what was that was my task to implement the DC the DC states such as um, pre-charging, current demand or cable check. These are DC specific states and I have implemented this these states. And of course from the first day, I had uh, great support from Andre. Um, he supported me to set up the, the project. Uh, yeah, that was always great. And he did um, great reviews of my code. Yeah, that was, that was great. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for listening. Back to Mark. Um, Mark, you're muted, I think. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're still muted. <laughs> okay. um, as I was saying, uh, thank you so, so much, Lucas. was a really smooth um, operation we did uh, together on the contribution for the DC side. Um, and uh, really, really work really well. And I hope we have more contributions like this in the future. Yeah. Thanks a lot also from our side. Contribution from everyone who's interested in making this a, a bulletproof solution for everyone is highly, highly appreciated. Right. So I would bring on Samantha. She had an eye on the questions. 
Samantha, what do we so, have? So thank you very much, lovely audience. We've got um, a total of four questions. And in first place with seven upwrotes is, under what license will Joseph be released? Good question. Yes, um, I do believe, well, at first I thought the MIT license, because uh, that's also what the previous project, uh, Rise V2G, which was written by me in Java and published 2015, um, and I liked it because it's it's a very open, very free license. Um, can also be used for commercial activities. It's not a copyleft license, so it's very free to use. However, I was recently made aware that this can have that can issue issues can arise um, related to patent litigations. So if a company um, provides code to the open source project and then wants to patent that, um, this can cause an issue. Uh, therefore. Right now, I believe we will rather license it under Apache license uh, version two. Um, right, yeah, that's, that's what we thought is um, makes most sense. Um, it's as free as MIT, but uh, specifically covers this patent litigation issue. Next Thank one. you, Mark. Um, so, second question: What EVSE hardware can be used for Joseph so that the charging energy transfer can happen? I could I take that one. Um, so on the hardware side, if you mean, if the person that did the question meant uh, Pedro, right? Um, meant on the requirements, um, as we said before, requires a Linux system, um, can be an ARM Cortex V7, V8, we support um, all of the main architectures and we can um, cross compile uh, Rexit to that architecture. We can also generate a bundle uh, for, for that architecture itself. Um, so that eases a lot the, the process of setting up so what you you see here on the Joseph community, we set it up um, with um, a few commands on the on the environment with the make file. But in a Joseph Pro implementation, we have a way to generate a full bundled application that contains the Python environment and all its dependencies. So it's pretty much like a plug and play solution, almost turnkey. Um, so that this is a lot the, the integration process. Uh, so in general, yeah, Linux um, Linux device with uh, those architectures um, can also be in development using uh, IMD64 or Intel 32 bits. Um, so it's very flexible on that. Good. Next one. Perfect. So we have quite a complex question here. I'll read it slowly and let's see how I do a pronunciation. Um, so does Joseph's ISO 1511 8-20 implementation support California Rule 21 requirements? Question one, is bidirectional AC supported, inverter in EV? And then in this gentleman's understanding, ISO 1511 um, 8-20 is a communication standard, but it, does it cover grid compatibility and all safety concepts? Uh, and then how is authenticating that an EV is grid compatible and supporting grid codes by the EV done? And then last question, last section, how does ISO 1511 8-20 relate to IEEE 2030.5? <laughs> so someone tried to put a whole lot of questions to do one. All right, let, let, me, let me start with that one. Um, to be honest, I don't know what California Rule 21 is. Um, if, if you know, um, let me know. Or maybe um, you could put, um, who was answering the question? Bjorn, if you could um, put more context into the chat, that would be much appreciated. I think there are some great uh, regulations on California side and also including a kind of Eichrecht. So um, also signing, metering, as we, I think is related to that, but I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure about it to okay. be honest at this moment. So Bjorn, if you could just type a bit more, although I don't see the chat, <laughs> but you see it, right? Okay, good. Um, for some reason, I have a hiccup with my chat window here. Um, question one, how is bi-directional EIC charging supported? Um, so Dash 20 provides support for both AC and DC bi-directional charging. In general, when it comes to grid codes, um, what a grid code is, is basically a set of rules and regulations on how to feed back power back into the grid um, to make sure that you feed it back in a, in a safe way to not destabilize the grid. Since all in all over Europe, the, the whole grid is interconnected. Um, so if there is some issue in one part of the grid, it can easily destabilize other parts of the grid. That's what grid codes are for, um, to make sure everything works smoothly. 
Um, so for DC chargers, it's easier um, because you can basically program the grid code into the stationary DC charger. The DC charger doesn't move. And grid codes are different from country to country within Europe uh, and maybe even different from, from grid operators within the same country. I'm not 100% sure. For AC charging, um, we, we, we made it possible to provide certain information via AC charging from the charger to the, ch to the vehicle such as what's the target frequency, what's the target um, um, active and reactive power, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but I think grid codes are a bit more complicated than that. Um, but at least this is kind of like the minimum set of, of you know, information that can be exchanged between charger and vehicle to make AC charging bi-directional happen. Um, how is authenticating that EV is grid compatible and supporting grid codes by the EV done? So I think that hopefully answers the question. And lastly, how does ISO 1511-20 relate to IEEE 2030.5? So IEEE 2030.5 is also known as, formerly known as the um, SEP 2.0 um, Smart Energy Profile, uh, which has been developed by uh, the utilities in North America or in the US, if I'm not mistaken, basically for the great utilities to directly control devices uh, such as an electric vehicle. I'm not sure how it relates to that. Um, I do believe that IEEE 2030.5 will be used to control a charging station. And then from there, the communication terminates and then it continues via ISO 1511A to the vehicle. Um, so you have this communication from vehicle to charger via 1508, from charger to back end, potentially via IEEE 2030.5, um, but I haven't been involved in any projects specifically to that. Did Björn provide yeah, more just, information? Uh, this integration for uh, the ER, so basically it describes um, uh, what kind of smart inverters can be used in the grid um, for, for uh, for behind the meter generators of, well, for V2G in this case. And um, just what I want to work right to Bjorn is that um, yeah, currently we don't have a native support for this kind of um, inverters, but uh, we have a modular system and we can integrate it or whoever uses uh, Joseph Pro, uh, which uh, wants to integrate uh, our solution with their own solution, then can, can also use uh, the specific driver for these inverters and use it with, uh, together with Joseph. So um, it's a matter of uh, flavor choice a bit and how much is it important for the clients that this is integrated. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, then, and on to our final question of the day. How do you manage with EVs not properly behaving to the specifications? <laughs> for example, when not obeying proper timings while slack matching? Yeah, we should burl, burn all those EVs, <laughs> no, but seriously, um, this is a tough question uh, indeed. Uh, specifically when it comes to, let's say, the first generation of electric vehicles um, that came out 2014, um, for DC charging only, um, that was like based on DINSPEC, early implementations of uh, DINSPEC 71 to 1. And there you have a, a wide variety of interpretations of DINSPEC. Um, so this is a bit of a challenge. Um, I'm not sure. Well, DINSPEC came out first in 2012, was updated in 2014, and now there is in a draft. It's in a draft state, right? Mm -hmm. With a new updated version of DINSPEC. So we will have to see to which degree we can still try to support the oldest version of DINSPEC. We may have to um, cut kind of like older implementations off, like. The first uh, generation of EVs was like BMW i3, um, Volkswagen Golf E, um, Chevy's um, Spark, or Chevy Volt Spark or something like this. And um, so we may or may not be able to support these fully because if you wanted to cater to each and every incompatible solution of EVs out there, we would basically hack Joseph to death. That doesn't make any sense. But um, what we do to make sure that it's interoperable with as many EVs as possible is, first of all, we go to each and every uh, char in testable. Those are these industry events that I talked about. They take place three times a year, um, always in these key regions, North America, Europe, and Asia. The next one is, by the way, in Poland. Um, that is on the 
30th of June and 1st of July um, at Electro Energetica. Um, for those who are interested, you can sign up for that. Plus, we will also um, arrange uh, um, bilateral training uh, testing um, events with different car manufacturers to make sure we are aware of all these corner cases. Just to add on that one quick thing. Um, so we, by using our um, free the community um, protocol and um, as well uh, offers here, we also include in Slack a way that you can configure the thresholds if necessary during the testing or even so developed. Of course, we, we promote the use of the standard and that's we are going to base on. So be closest as possible to the standard, what the standard defines. But uh, we understand that in the community and during testing, that's not always uh, the systems are relying on the standard and do kind of shady things and funny things around. Um, so you, by using our community version, you can also have a chance to uh, test Slack and uh, alter the parameters and see what works the best for your application. Yeah. Last but not least, I mean, that's what Joseph community is about, right? To provide a kind of like gold standard or reference implementation, <clears throat> however you want to call it, so that all the car manufacturers out there have a implementation to test with. And the more car manufacturers that do use Joseph to simulate a charging station, the less we run into these interoperability issues. Great. Thanks, Amanda. And with that, we are at the end of our webinar, slightly over time, but I hope you forgive us for that. Um, last but not least, I want to make you aware of the call to action button in the bottom here. Learn more about Joseph in a 30-minute expert talk. Um, there you can schedule a meeting with um, Stuart, um, our chief commercial officer, and he's happy to tell you more if you are interested. With that being said, thanks a lot for attending this webinar for all your very interesting questions. Again, this webinar is recorded um, under the same URL. You can rewatch the webinar later on. And as we did with the last two webinars, we will also create a new blog post where we will post the recording and the slides we presented today on that uh, blog post and um, also list the questions that came up during today's webinar and answer them in more detail. Um, thank you all for joining and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you.